Uh, the main aims were to determine by survey inquiry the relationships between self-reported claims of haunting and poltergeist experience and personal well-being, that's people's feelings about their quality of life, and transliminality, which is the movement of psychological content such as perceptions, emotions, cognitions, into and out of consciousness. It's a little bit like remembering and forgetting, but the, the sources are quite numerous and that will become a little bit clearer as we go along. Uh, the major practical aim of the study was to gauge the after-effects of so-called psychic clearing, or clearing for short, which is the work that Rob Tilly does, just over here, and you'll hear from him a bit later. Okay, some basic terms. All right, definition of haunting. You probably know this, if you've seen a few um, horror films in your time, you'll know what haunting generally is. Um, one, one official definition is this one. Uh, the more or less regular occurrence of paranormal phenomena associated with particular uh, localities, especially buildings, and usually attributed to the activities of a discarnate entity, uh, what most people commonly know as a ghost. Uh, the phenomena may include apparitions, poltergeist disturbances, cold drafts, sounds of steps and voices, and various odours. Then we come to poltergeists. That's a disturbance characterised by bizarre physical effects of paranormal origin, suggesting mischievous or destructive intent. These phenomena include the unexplained movement or breakage of objects, loud raps, the lighting of fires, and occasionally personal injury to people. Um, uh, these, these definitions probably trigger what you've seen in, in movies on television that are, you know, have a, a horror or paranormal theme. Transliminality is the hypothesised tendency for psychological material to cross thresholds into or out of consciousness. Um, this kind of work goes back to um, the psychodynamic tradition of Freud and Jung and so on. Uh, and before that, the philosophers were talking about like an unconscious co uh, realm of the mind where all your thoughts and memories were and these uh, could exist as complexes and so on and they could disturb consciousness. Um, and involve remembering and forgetting in various ways, often through dreams and so on. Uh, now, transliminality came a little bit later. Um, it was a measure used by Dr. Michael Thalborn, um, the transliminality scale, um, and that was one of the first attempts to quantify those experiences. It correlates with paranormal belief, um, which we'll call PB, and even works well as a PB measure, but it also describes a process which I've just sort of emulated as, as, a, as a process of crossing over. So paranormal belief is basically just um, what you've experienced in your life and what you hold to be true, whereas translimin transliminality is actually a process as well, a mental process. Uh, it indicates people's sensitivity to their surroundings and their psychic environment. So um, a, a cover, cover term for transliminality is probably sensitivity um, that might be more, um, a more manageable or less unwieldy term to use to describe transliminality. Um, now, it's predicted reports of poltergeist experiences, encounter experiences, general paranormal experiences, and paranormal ability. And some of those um, themes we'll be looking at this afternoon, and Rob will talk about them further. Um, some pr real practical tests of this. At the Edinburgh's South Bridge Vaults, which was allegedly haunted, High transliminals, that's people that score high on that scale I just measured, uh, mentioned, uh, they reported more anomalous experiences, and that will be due to their sensitivity. Um, uh, these effects were not replicated at Edwards Place in Springfield, Illinois, but generally the findings are replicated. There's, there's always exceptions, and there may be reasons for that. Uh, more basic terms, because we also looked at personal well-being. We wanted to see how people describe their lives after they had their houses cleared. Um, otherwise, why do it? Uh, now, this personal well-being uh, is, is the same as subjective well-being. Uh, we'll call it SWB for short. It means quality of life. And if you think about your quality of life, you usually ask yourself uh, things about what's my standard of living like, what about my health, my achievement in life, my relationships, my feelings of safety, am I connected with my community, and how secure do I feel? All those things um, can separately be measured and come out with a total... Um, quality of life indicator, which we'll call subjective well-being. And the main one, clearing. Um, this is described as a process by which 
the problems with hauntings and poltergeists are resolved. For example, clients are asked to visualise the room and house as being filled with a brilliant, intense white light. The spirits of the white light are asked to protect the clients from evil and bright, and sorry, and bring love, light, and truth. And the troublesome spirits are invited by the clearer and the good spirits, or good spooks as Rob calls them, to go to the light. Okay, our aims and methods. Determine what types of people request clearing services by measuring transliminality and comparing sample average scores to norms. So this, there are Australian norms and Western norms um, that are like averages that everybody generally um, scores and we want to look to see what um, a clients score on as well, that we can compare them to the norms. Are they, are they sort of below par or above par or, at, or you know, on par? Uh, and determine current levels of wellbeing in a clearing sample and compare the sample mean scores to corresponding norms. And number three, determine whether clearing has utility, that is, is it effective, based on the sample survey responses and the mean scores for those things I just mentioned. And we'll look at some correlations as well. Okay, now I'll, I'll just describe the kinds of people that uh, we visited or, or Rob visited. The sample consisted of 30 su surveyed cases these cases derived mostly from home visits where clearing work was conducted by Rob Tilly. Uh, the measures I've already introduced, the transliminality scale, that's number two on the list in the personal wellbeing index. Um, we also took demographic details, which is your age and sex and so on. Uh, we asked people how successful the clearing was, um, the duration of the event, in other words, how long were these phenomena uh, occurring, uh, what life was like after the clearing and so on. Um, we also asked whether they thought it was a haunt or a poltergeist and um, describe the phenomena you've experienced, like what you saw, heard, smelled, tasted and so on. The, the survey, uh, these were posted out or emailed to former clients. They, were, they completed those surveys and sent them back to me. Continuing with the sample. There were 30 clients altogether. Um, by the way, we sent lots out, but um, not all of them came back, so we, we pushed for a target of 30 and decided to stop there. Um, the average age was 50 years. Uh, there was eight males and 22 females. 13 clients lived with a significant other and one child only. Six lived with a significant other only, a spouse, de facto, or partner. 10 lived alone, and the remaining occupant was a West Australian woman who lived with a, a non-significant other, which we take to mean a friend, and a number of her own children. There were nine clients uh, who reported having lived in a haunted house before, so it seems like the pat, there's a, a, something following them around. Um, now, the residences and the locations. The most common residence was a house, that's 70%. Nine clients lived in flats, units, or apartments. And the vast majority were in the, in the New South Wales area, with four clients living in Queensland and only one from Western Australia, whom I just mentioned. And um, so, well, what are they experiencing? We'll, we'll call these anomalies. The most common psychic experiences were a sensed presence. In other words, you, you think something is around, you can just feel it. And what you'll note is that some of these um, phenomena reported here are, uh, are the same as what Tony M uh, Mowbray was talking about earlier. Uh, a sense presence and a sense of being stared at, which is quite common. The most common sightings were apparitions of deceased entities you do not know, objects moving or being moved, and lights switching on and off, by, by themselves that is. Uh, the most common sounds were banging, like doors or windows making noises, uh, footsteps, uh, name calling or hearing voices, and the most common types of atmospheric or physical touching were uh, being uh, touching of the victim, in other words, feeling something touching you on the back or the arm, uh, and a mis mysterious sense of cold spots, which is quite a common one, actually. I'm just going to illustrate the kinds of things that were reported, and these are quotes. These are the kinds of things that people said um, in their reports, and they're only representative. Uh, confusion caused by various psychokinetic disturbances, those are the physical phenomena, uh, some of which I mentioned. Shadowy figures and misplaced items, nightmares about a ghost on the premises, terrifying dreams, feelings of being watched, terrorised by sudden feelings of being strangled and constant mind and body paralysis, vivid frightening dreams, cold rooms, dark shadows, objects being thrown, physical harm as in scratches and bruises, growling noises and being woken by spooks at night. 
Uh, but what, what we did find was that transliminality uh, did not correlate with clearing success. In other words, how successful did you feel the clearing was and what's your life like now? So in other words, um, if, if you felt that the, the clearing was successful or life is really great now, it has nothing to do with how you scored on that transliminality measure. And um, on the other hand, it did correlate with the sixth sense, including sense presence and feeling of being stared at. And, and logically, that would mean that um, if you're more sensitive, you're going to report uh, uh, more sensed presences and more feelings of being stared at. Okay, uh, the subjective well-being, that's on par with Western and Australian norms. The global satisfaction uh, of life was on par with norms. And uh, attitudes towards spirituality and religion or their, their experiences of, of, of their spiritual life and their religious life, they were on par with Australian norms as well. So they're a pretty normal lot, these people, apart from the experiences that they're having. Uh, but it was good, what we, uh, what we felt was it was good that um, uh, these things were, that the people were on par with the, with the Western and Australian norms. Now, we'll look at success rates. Um, you can have a quick look at the table that's break down, broken down by males and females. Um, we, we looked at complete or partial success, um, also whether uh, the events were not successful at all. Um, we found overall 88% regarded their residence as cleared at least partially. Um, to be more specific, 66% felt that their residences were completely um, successfully cleared of haunts and 68% thought completely successful of poltergeists. So they're very close. But we do um, maintain that distinction between haunts and poltergeists as well. One third of clients lived in a haunted residence prior to living in the current residences, sorry, residence where the episodes occurred. Experiences were described in paranormal or anomalous terms. Client scores on subjective well-being were on par with corresponding norms. And 66 to 68% of clients reported successful haunt poltergeist clearing. So um, it's best now to try and give you a picture of the typical client. She's a 40-year-old uh, woman at the time the haunt poltergeist episode occurred. She lives in a house lived in a house at the time. She has a significant other and one child, although 10% lived alone. Uh, there are other occupants generally ex that, who generally experience the same anomalies. She is a, a low transliminal, and she, in other words, she scores low on that transliminality scale, um, suggesting that she's not all that sensitive by normal standards. Uh, she's emotionally stable. She's not very reactive to stress and she's prone to introversion and passivity. In other words, not, she's not very uh, extroverted and outgoing and so on. Uh, she's cognitively organised, so she's not prone to imagining things. She's not prone to dissociation either or unusual experiences. And males and females were the same in that regard, even though the typical client is generally female. Men were coming out the same. So that's it. Uh, thank you, Rob, for a job well done. Well, Rob's going to give you some more personal hands-on experience now. You, okay, well, as you heard, um, uh, 80 subjects were a pretty ordinary bunch. Uh, they weren't mentally ill. They are all psychic. And uh, uh, the things that I've learned from this, this is the first time, so far as we can tell, that anyone has ever done research like this in parapsychology. It's certainly in the English language. And don't you find that quite extraordinary? Um, I started in 1994 being taught how to psychically clear haunted houses, so that's 25 years ago, and uh, I estimate I've done 550 poltergeist haunted houses, even a few uh, possession cases in that time, uh, with a success rate of 88 or 66 percent, whichever applies. Now, <clears throat> one of the benefits that came with this is we, we applied to the tax office uh, for a tax break. Um, tax office knocked us back on research, they wouldn't do that. But uh, they, they granted us a, a deductible gift recipient status um, for my work in uh, relief of suffering, distress and helplessness. Okay. <laughs> so you can imagine the tabloid media tomorrow, Ghostbusters get tax break. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and that allowed uh, the Cardigan Fund uh, to fund us today, we couldn't do it without that money from 
Cardigan Fund. So if there's any of you out there who've got a tax problem and you want to give some money to us, talk to me or Lance about that a bit later on, okay? Tax <laughs> <laughs> no, tax busters. Um, okay. Uh, so, as I said earlier, all the participants in our study, all 30 of them, have a history of psychic experiences. It's a kind of lifelong. And you find that uh, uh, it's only psychic people that report poltergeists and haunting that have psychic experiences. Um, so one of the other interesting things that, that came out of this research is that nobody was mentally ill. Okay? None, none of the people in our study were mentally ill. Now, so where does the idea that if you live in a haunted house or you're reporting psychic things, where does that idea come from that some, there's something wrong with you, you're mentally ill? Where does that idea come from? Okay? People Sorry? People with psychosis. Yeah, okay. The people that are psychotic yeah. have very similar symptoms. Okay. Or may report similar things. Yeah, they may. Okay. So I read back, I've read everything <coughs> published in the English, English language to 1940 and beyond on, on the poltergeist subject, and I came across this case 1939 in London as a, a psychiatrist, an American psychiatrist, Dr. Nandor Fodor, who uh, published an article, it was published in 1940 in the American Journal of Parapsychology, and he described this as a case of uh, poltergeist psychosis. Okay? Now, the case was uh, this young woman uh, who shared a house in Chelsea in London with another young woman, and they knew this house to be a 300-year-old haunted house. Okay? And the young woman who, who uh, needed help was obviously psychic, her flatmate wasn't, so she attracted all the poltergeist problems. Um, so she goes to see psychoanalyst, psychiatrist Dr. Nandor Fodor, and he claims that using psychoanalysis he cured her of poltergeist psychosis. Now it's clear to me that Fodor didn't know what he was talking about. He knew nothing about psychic phenomena at all. Um, the young woman was depressed at the time, and if you're depressed, you're more vulnerable to poltergeist psychic attack. So she goes to see Dr. Nandor Fodor, and using psychoanalysis, he boosts her ego and her self-confidence. She feels absolutely marvellous. She goes back home. She writes a note for the poltergeist, sticks it on the front door. Don't knock the door, ring the bell. <laughs> okay, and she's angry now. And this young woman... Interestingly, he was an independent filmmaker in 1939, so she must have been quite a strong personality. So once she re regained her self-confidence, um, the poltergeist couldn't get any more emotional responses from her, so he wandered off. Okay? That's the explanation. She was never psychotic. She was psychic. That was the underlying psychology. So what happened then in 1940, once that paper was published on poltergeist psychosis, all the psychiatrists got in on it, and the psychologists, and they convinced themselves that when somebody experiences poltergeist or haunting, it exists in your mind only. It has no external reality. So we've had 80 years of this nonsense now. Sorry, <laughs> I'm not accusing you. I'm just, I'm just going by what's published, okay? So... I know that you understand because you, yeah, okay. So, um, so, so that's what's happened. It's, and it's, it's like in 1940, parapsychology or the Society for Psychical Research got hijacked by the psychiatrists and the psychologists and the therapeutic psychologists and the uh, psychoanalytic psychologists and later parapsychologists. And it seems at that time the psychic people who actually are psychic know what they're talking about, they got squeezed out and they've been excluded ever since. I found 117 poltergeist cases published in all the different journals, the British, American, South African, European journals, 117 poltergeist cases. Only one case, 1984 in Los Angeles, the Kern City poltergeist, where a mother and a 15-year-old daughter went into the house, cleared it in the same way that I do in about an hour and a half, described the woman, a previous owner of the house, who'd been haunting the place. That paper was published in 1984 and caused a huge storm between the psychologist, the psychiatrist, and the spiritualist. So there seems to be this bias has existed up to now. Um, when you read back, uh, I've got a couple of quotes here from uh, Society of Psychical Research, 1901. 
This is by Frank Podmore. He describes a poltergeist case here. He says, the phenomenon ceased after a service performed by a bishop on the morning of the 6th of May. No further details. There's another one here from 1903. The cure exorcised the four-month-old child after convincing himself of the reality of the facts. He does not say how. The exorcism was successful. So you've got this history. For all of human history, there's always been psychic people like me who could put a stop to poltergeistry and haunting and possession cases. But in 1940, the whole thing got hijacked. We've now had 80 years of this uh, psycho babble, as I call it. And all the leading authors in this area admit that they haven't got a clue what a poltergeist is. Harry Price, in 1945, he wrote Poltergeist Saver England. And he, I quote here, he says, Can we explain the poltergeist? No, we know nothing whatsoever about why poltergeists should infest a place, what they are, how to get rid of them, or how to attract them. Professor George Owen from Cambridge, 1964, on the Matthew Manning case, he thought that Matthew Manning was the cause of all the poltergeistry. He offers no conclusion after 436 pages, but he, he says no one case points un unambiguously to intervention of a discarnate entity. The leading poltergeist researcher, Dr. William Roll, 1972, said, we really do not know anything about poltergeists. The Enfield poltergeist case in London, um, Maurice Gross, one of the researchers who published, said that uh, I don't know what a poltergeist is, and nor does anybody else. Further, he said, anybody who says they know is a charlatan. I like to think of that comment as a gross insult. Professor Alan Gold from the University of Northampton, 1979. Um, what forces are at work in the production of poltergeist phenomena? The answer is that we do not have the slightest idea. Guy Lyon Playfair in the foreword to South Shields Poltergeist in 2008 said, Indeed, we really haven't got a clue what, are, what they are, yet they are almost certainly not spirits or ghosts of the dead. And again in Playfair in 2011 said, I often get asked the question very briefly, can you explain what a poltergeist is? And my answer is invariably, very briefly, no, and nor can anyone else. So in academic parapsychology, the leading theory on poltergeist activity was, and still is, that boys and girls at the age of puberty somehow project a repressed and frustrated energy from the subconscious mind. Most researchers now believe that the poltergeist is not a demon or a ghost at all, but an unknown energy emanating from the psychokinetic mind of a disturbed adolescent child. So the victims of poltergeist should get the blame for causing the trouble when in fact they're frightened and confused. It gets even crazier. William Roll wrote that uh, he said he always excluded a psychic explanation. Okay? So you're trying to find a non-psychic explanation for psychic phenomena. And it's just nonsense, right? So Roll goes on to say that uh, uh, we really do not know, but if persons involved have had psychic experiences before, particularly if they're s similar to the present experiences, this may indicate that the persons are important to the phenomena. He's getting close. Sometimes these suppo supposed psychic experiences are only the effects of an imaginative or diseased mind. Or if the person has been excessively interested in psychic or occult matters, it may be that the present incidents are only due to imagination and exaggeration of ordinary happenings. So, Roll goes on, I will state again that something else besides repressed hostility must comprise the difference between those who express this unknown psychokinetic ability and those who express themselves by normal means, and that this key difference so far eludes our psychological tests. You know what eludes their psychological tests? The fact that the people are psychic. It's just astonishing, isn't it? Okay, so psychiatry and psychology have got a lot to answer for. People being told they're mentally ill when they're not. Uh, can I finish, please? Okay. Um, so, we'll move on from there to... Um, so how do I psychically clear 
haunted houses. One thing I can tell you, it is not, it is not exorcism. Okay, exorcism is at best not very effective and usually makes matters worse, much worse. People die, people get killed during exorcism. Professor Sarah Ferber at the University of Wollongong, Wollongong she's a secular historian, and she's identified 30 deaths during exorcism in the last 30 years. I'll give you an example of some of them here. Um, no, 2007 in New Zealand, a woman drowned while being held under water in an attempt to drive out an evil spirit by a bunch of Anglican exorcists. Okay? Joan Volmer, 49, the wife of a pig farmer, died during exorcism at her home in Antwerp, a tiny town in rural Victoria in 1993. The exorcism lasted for four days. The Lutherans tied her to a chair and used physical force on her lower abdomen, squeezing as hard as they could, forcing the demons up through her body and out through her mouth. It was this pressure applied to her neck that caused her to have a heart attack. Okay? Uh, Joan Volmer had been diagnosed as schizophrenic after admission to a mental hospital. The exorcist received prison sentences. Okay, um, there's another one here in uh, uh, Romania, 2005. A Romanian nun was gagged and bound and tied to a crucifix in her convent. She died of malnutrition and starvation. The priest got 14 years. Okay, so... My advice is don't let the, the exorcists in your house, don't let them in the front door, not even one at a time. <laughs> okay. So if exorcism doesn't work and people get killed in the process, why would the church persist with it? Um, Will Storr, as a British journalist, he interviewed the senior exorcist at the Vatican, the father, Gabriele Amorth, and he questioned Amorth about a young 23-year-old theology student, Annalise Michel, who died of malnutrition in 1976, after 10 months of exorcism. Uh, Father Amorth said that, I know this case very well. She was a girl who was offered to God for forgiveness of our sins. She died for God. God allowed her to be possessed by the devil. They blamed the exorcist because she, she died while she was being exorcised. Then they prosecuted the exorcist and the girl's parents. The prosecution was ridiculous and unworthy. It wasn't the fault of the exorcists or the parents. It was the will of God. Isn't that a nice passing the buck statement? The church is not held responsible. So what else we got to say here? Um, now it goes on and on. So uh, my advice would be don't let the exorcists in your house and... Uh, for me, to understand Christianity, I shall rely on Monty Python. <laughs> <laughs> so why, why doesn't the exorcism work? Why is that? And I remember uh, during, during the philosophy of religion, Sydney Uni, a long time ago, we were told that um, there's no proof that Jesus Christ ever existed and that God is an idea borrowed from the Jews and that... Uh, uh, Satan and the devil were a creation of theology to add some symmetry to theology and that uh, Bible superhero Saint Michael, Arch Archangel Michael, leader of God's army, almost never turns up to do the job. So it seems to me these Bible characters have no existence outside of uh, the Christian imagination. And further to that, on that same theme, the people that taught me, I was taught by half a dozen people, mostly women, and they all started their, learning their skills in spiritualist churches. But over time, they all gave the church away. And they found that psychically clearing haunted houses, psychically, without mentioning any Bible heroes, was every bit as effective. So it does seem as though the Bible heroes are just add to the problem. So, so that's the technique that I've been, I've been taught. And that's a technique that I use, which is good news for parapsychologists because it means that psychically clearing places is purely psychological work. It's not, it doesn't involve religion at all. One of the other things that came out of the research that Lance and I have done is that uh, eight of the cases of clearing were done remotely. So this is where I'm living here in Sydney and I've cleared haunted houses in 
Narrabri, Toowoomba, Brisbane, one in Kalamunda in West Australia. So I never met the people, never went to the house. It's all done psychically. Okay? So it's a wonderful opportunity for parapsychology to, uh, to move on because of all those authors that I mentioned that, that believed in the psychodynamic explanation, they've all since died and there's only Professor Alan Gould at Northampton University who's still with us. So there might be a generational change where a new generation of young parapsychologists can take a fresh approach to uh, poltergeists and hauntings. Now, the only difference I can see between a poltergeist and a haunting is just personality. When I see a haunted house, most of the people doing the haunting are pretty dopey. They're clueless and they're frightened. But there's always one ringleader who's usually got a criminal background. His personality style matches prison populations and he's very psychic. So I don't see any, any difference between hauntings and poltergeists in my experience. So, um, Where do we go next? Okay. We tried to find out how effective exorcism is. Um, Will Storr, when he interviewed Professor, sorry, uh, Father <coughs> Gabriele Amorth, a Vatican chief exorcist, who's about 90 years of age now, Amorth told Will Storr that he'd done 160,000 exorcisms in his life. Uh, professor Brian Carger, who's a, a religious professor from Texas, he said that number is closer to 70,000. Um, with numbers like that, oh, and, and that's confused because uh, baptism is considered to be an exorcism. So what's the real numbers? Nobody knows. But any parapsychologist will tell you that with numbers like that, you've got to get lucky once in a while. So I, I estimate that the effectiveness of the exorcism is no better than you'd expect by chance, which is about 5%. Okay, um, let's, where should we go next? I think we move on to, I quickly tell you now how to clear, how, how I've been taught to psychically clear. Uh, I, I'll, I'll start with a possession case because this illustrates how it works the best. This young man came to me, he was just about 31, in 2013 came to me and a uh, highly intelligent young man with insight. And he knew that he was haunted. He wasn't mentally ill at all. But the, he told me that when he was a child, he developed this relationship with spooks in the house. And over time, the amount of control, as this child grew older, the amount of control that the possessing entity had over the, the boy increased over time. So by the time Dan came to see me, um, he had involuntary body movement, so he showed me it was so bad that the, his clenched his fists so badly that the fingernails dug into the palm of his hands and he was bleeding from the hands and he had involuntary body movements. He said the controlling entity had uh, deleted parts of his memory, couldn't feel any emotion, uh, controlled his mind and often caused him to say things inappropriate, so he got fired from jobs, several jobs. So trying to find out more about this entity, because these possession cases are really rare. I think I've only done about five in 25 years. So um, I decided why can't we interview this, en this entity because Dan could, he is, he is this voice night and day, keeps him awake, persecutory, evil, criticizing him endlessly. So Ian Denker, who's at the back of the room there, Ian and I set up a conversation with Dan and the entity. So we had, the three of us had a four-way conversation. And Ian's a much more forceful interrogator than I am. <laughs> but we couldn't find any way to appeal to this entity's better judgment. His narcissistic, stunning lack of empathy and compassion. We spent three hours trying to get, get him to appeal to, to uh, being kinder to Dan. And it's just a waste of time. So we ended up exhausted by the whole thing. One time while I was talking to Dan and holding eye contact with him, a very chilling experience where Dan's eyes changed and suddenly this other entity is in the body staring at me, trying to frighten me. And I'd never had that experience before. And I must say it was rather chilling. But I don't show any fear. I just thought, is Dan doing this? No, I trust him. So what I decided to do, I, I thought, well, I'll ask the good spooks because the way I clear haunted houses is teamwork. 
The good spooks do the clearing. I'm here in the physical world. I answer the phone, do emails, talk to people, explain things. Okay, so I said to the good spooks, how do we deal with this entity? How do we get rid of this entity? And I said, why don't we give him an overwhelming, life-changing, emotional, transforming experience? Good spooks said, yeah. <laughs> so one morning, I, I meditate for an hour every morning, and afterwards I thought, well, we'll do this, this rooster now. Um, so I locked onto him psychically because I got a good memory of him because we've been talking to him for hours. He knew that I could see him. He got a bit frightened. And then maybe two, three hundred thousand good spooks surround him in every direction, above and below, and they're all flooding him with powerful emotions, good emotions. There's no words involved. It's just an emotional transformation experience. So he's feeling emotions he never knew he had. He's really disturbed by it. So it's mixed in with all the anger and the conceit and the narcissism, mixed in with love and, and compassion. So he's totally Im immobilized and confused. And he wouldn't turn around and look at me. He turned, slumped over and moved off into the middle distance. And I said, well, sport, I'm finished with you. Uh, if you want any help, you ask the good spooks. I'm finished with you. So I got my diary out, made some notes left a message for Dan on his phone. Three weeks later, he calls back. He says, he's gone. And I said, when did he go? Three weeks ago. OK. So that's how it works. Nobody gets killed. Nobody gets hurt. Everybody benefits. I feel good. The good spooks feel good. Dan's happy. It's a win-win-win situation. So that's how it works. Um, Okay, we got time for Where's Tony? <laughs> I've been rather critical of I've been rather critical of uh, psychologists and psychiatrists. You're a senior lecturer in psychology at the University of Western Sydney. <laughs> Do you have any you don't buy into this? Okay. I'll rectify that one. we have five minutes for questions before right. we talk, so Okay. Um, thank you so yeah. much, Rob. I, I totally related to what Can you were everyone hear her? To no, what okay. you were saying about um, organisations like this being hijacked by psychologists and psychiatrists. Yeah. I found it really interesting that in your study, the overwhelming majority of uh, sensitives were female. Yes. Uh, they're, they're the knowers, they're the holders of the wisdom in yes. this area. Yeah. And yet... I think this organisation, like so many other around the world, are dominated by men. The vast majority of the presenters are males. Yeah. The vast majority are not the holders of the wisdom. Yeah. So my question is, when will there be a shift? When will women be allowed their rightful place in actually taking leadership and guidance roles? Because I have no doubt that if you asked practically every woman in this room, yeah, yeah. what kind of spiritual, psychic, whatever experiences they've had, yeah. you would get a rich cornucopia well. of amazing experiences. <laughs> but we're silenced. Okay. So, thank you. I must point out, no, uh, uh, back to, jo to Joy. Um, most of the people that taught me were women. Most of them are mediums. They keep a very low profile. I, I decided I wasn't going to keep a low profile. I'm 70 now. I really don't care what people say or think of me. This stuff needs to be said, yeah. and I'm happy to say it. So when, when does it change? I think, How do we get in the door? Can I just have a show of hands? Anybody here who clears psychic, psychic clears haunted houses? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? There's no secret, but you've all learned to keep your head down because you don't need the, the hassles. Okay? But there's also a choice that's yeah. made to favour the academic rather than the holders of the wisdom. So at what point does that choice change? Oh, when, when it's okay, when it's okay, and can we finish this question, please? It's when it's okay for people like me to talk about this in university and I'm taken seriously. That's when it changes, I think. Never. <laughs> <laughs> it might have. My got, biggest, got the mic, got the mic. My biggest concern at the moment is that there's a lot of young adolescent 
um, children or children coming into adolescence who are becoming more psychic than yeah. in the past. And a lot of them are therefore suffering um, great pressure because they don't understand what's happening and there's um, a massive vacuum of psychic um, tutelage and experience yeah. to help these young people understand what is happening to them, yeah. why they're feeling suicidal, why they're hearing voices, yeah. why they are so intuitive and so sensitive emotionally to yeah. what's going on around them. Yeah. And um, I'm actually feeling a sense of desperation and fear because we've had this lack of um, development of understanding psychic ability. Well, it's, like a lack of it. it's spirituality. It's the Absolutely. psychology of spirituality is what we're talking yes. about. Yeah. And therefore, society is currently not prepared yeah. for these kids. Yeah. And, uh, and so, therefore, we're really losing the plot with these kids. And I see a lot of them attending psychiatric wards. Yeah. being given huge amounts of medications yeah. and then they come to me and say, I can't feel anymore and I've also lost all my memories. Yeah. And, uh, and, and their numbers are much greater than the past. Yeah. So it's very worrying and it's almost like, I suppose what I'm saying here is a call to action. Yeah. We really need to start moving on this because we're losing a generation and all yeah. subsequent generations. Yeah, uh, I think that you've got... The Religion's in complete decline. Okay, so nobody looks to the church for answers anymore. And uh, in the same way that our bodies attempt to heal themselves from illness and in injury, so too the human psyche. So I think it's just, you know, the evolution of consciousness in society. And uh, what we know will eventually become normal. Uh, but it's, it's a long process. So. Yeah, and it also requires the academics to admit that they don't have the answers because this is yeah. where it's going wrong. Because if they could just admit for once, yeah. we don't have the answers here and we really don't understand what's going on. Yeah. And we don't understand why, yeah. despite a patient coming 50 times, yeah. um, if they can afford to, to see a yeah. psychologist and a psychiatrist, yeah. why it's not working. Well, I'm hoping that what I've said today um, but might, you're preaching might stir to the up converted. <laughs> you're preaching to the converted. You know, this has got to get into mainstream. But I think, I think like what I've said here, and all I've done is, is read the history of parapsychology mm. and quote back, to, uh, back mm. to you. So for all of human history, there's always been people like us and you. It's just normal part of what it is to be human. So I think that will answer your question. <laughs>